Hello and welcome back to Maker Chat Live. I'm your host, Adam Krutinger, and today we're going to be talking about making magic with the one and only Garrett Thomas. Stick around. And welcome to the show, Garrett. How are you doing? I'm doing very well. How are you? Good, good. I'm so excited to talk to you because you are such a, a creative uh, mind. And, and one thing I wanted to really talk about you is uh, talk to you about is uh, your creative process, your brainstorming, and even get into things like creative block. Because even though you're a magician, I think a lot of these topics can really apply to a lot of different forms of making and, and the creative outlet. But uh, before we get too deep into that, where I wanted to start off with is just to give people a frame of reference for your kind of your philosophy on magic in a, in a short version of it. Well, you know, I, I am a magician, but I often think of myself as an artist and magic just happens to be my medium. Uh, so my greatest joy in art is to make people think and make people question and, uh, you know, be the lie that represents the truth, be the thing that Picasso says that art is the lie that represents the truth. Uh, I love that. And I, I think magic hits the nail on the head with that. So I enjoy uh, the gift of magic. And but in in my soul, I'm more of an artist. Uh, if I could astonish you with a painting or a sculpture, and I do paint and sculpt, uh, I would do that as well. Yeah, yeah, yeah. No, that's that's interesting. And you know, uh, you have you run an amazing YouTube channel that you started recently. That's really it. Really, kind of gets inside your mind. I feel you call. Is it the series or the main channel that you call like a magician's perspective? Yeah, uh, just my, the magician's point of view. Okay. Uh, how uh, I, f through the lens of a magician slash artist slash creative, uh, reminding people that we are all creative. Technically, we are all artists. You know, you started with this blank slate and created this identity. That's an art form. Yeah. You know, it was a blank canvas. It wasn't, you know, Adam. It yeah. became Adam. You ch made the choices to make it Adam. That's art. Uh, and we, you know, and then at the same time, I believe we're all magicians in many ways. Uh, I'm a performance ma magician as well, but I do believe that on many levels, we do create our own reality. And uh, we just forget that conversation was, was words and spells. And now it's called texting, but spelling mm -hmm. comes from the word spells. And uh, we are enchanting each other with these ideas so i love uh reminding people hey you're a magician too you know uh i'm just the one on stage yeah no of course and and i think i think you're kind of opening uh, your first video that you posted gave a really good frame of it i'm going to play a quick clip up from it just so people can get a good idea of what we're talking about garrett thomas here i started this journey with one thing in mind to be a real magician someone who doesn't just do magic shows in my life, I learned many things that'll help you think like a magician. All art is magic. Art is the act of creation, and seeing through the eyes of a magician will benefit you. I believe I started carving out a path as a modern magician. So join me on this journey as I bring you along and give you tips, tricks, shortcuts, in-depth theory that'll benefit you in your life and all your creative endeavors. And, and I really love that. Uh, but one thing I wanted to help uh, people get a frame around too is what exactly do you mean by a real magician? Um, well, the word magic comes from the word magi, mm -hmm. which is just a, a wise man, somebody who knows something that most people don't or takes a point of view that most people wouldn't take. Uh, from my experience, the magician is not someone outside of society, but there's someone that understands both points of view. Uh, someone that understands the logic and science and math of something, but at the same time understands the emotion, the symbolism, the metaphor and religion of, of something, the spiritual uh, conceptual world that we all have to live in. Uh, you know, so a magician never had this supernatural baggage that the term magic sometimes gets because, you know, but even though deep down, we know that's not true. We call things magic markers. We call things you know, like just experiences. Your first kiss was a magical moment. 
we know that the idea of magic has to deal with concepts. Mm. Uh, some a rainbow is a magical experience. Uh, you know, it's just you know there is a science behind it. It doesn't matter if there's a science behind it. There's it just matters the feeling it evokes, uh, and that's connected with all art. Uh, you know, I think everything starts as magic. Then it's one person knows something and no one else knows it. But then it becomes art if all the other people start knowing about it and start appreciating it. Ooh, look what that guy's doing. Look what he's doing. Yeah. Now it's no longer magic. Now it's art. You know, and then once enough people start doing it, it becomes identity. Oh, I'm going to wear clothes and I'm going to take this title and I'm going to choose a name and I'm going to choose a job and that's going to represent me. Yeah. So it starts with magic. Then it becomes art. Then it becomes identity or truth. It becomes science or medicine. It just, it's all connected uh, if you're honest about it. You know, what happens is somewhere along that journey, people project their own opinions on certain magicians. Let's say, you know, everybody assumed that, that groups, you know, old groups like witches were, uh, in league with the devil, but in reality, they were doing a lot of chemistry. You know, they they were messing with with uh, the earth and figuring out what it does. You know, to our mind, and and they've created things like alcohol and and some bad things that are not good for us. Uh, you know, but it wasn't the truth that they thought they were ever doing anything supernatural. They thought it was science, and in, in many ways, they thought they were figuring out and experimenting with uh with the chemistry of the earth and yeah. they were wrong about a lot of things but yeah. you know right about some and now we have pharmacies yeah and from other people's perspective too that of not having that knowledge is kind of what makes it seem like now ma magic you know a big part of under of enjoying magic is not knowing the method but 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 also in knowing it there can be a lot of you know it's more like a dance then which we can get into in a second too but just out of curiosity have you ever heard um Sam Harris talk about um, real magic versus fake magic. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. He, in his book, uh, Awake, I think he really talks about it heavy. Yeah. Uh, I have, I have yeah. a quick clip of it, and I just want oh, to – I'd be interested to see kind of what you what you think yeah. about this clip. Love it. All right, here it goes. Paradoxically, real magic is fake magic, and fake magic is real magic. The only, the only real magic in the world produced by magicians – is the fake magic where the, the magician like someone like Darren Brown will tell you actually no I can't read minds and I, I did put the rabbit in the hat and it, this is fake but but the the surprise is that even knowing it's fake you can't understand how this effect is being achieved whereas the fake magicians are the ones who are pretending to be real who are who are hiding who are not acknowledging the mechanics the real mechanics behind what is in fact effective you know the, the the illusion that the rabbit pops out of the hat yeah. now you know there that's an older clip from uh uh harris uh he he was talking about a very uh truncated tr use of the word magic mm -hmm. to me uh the real magic is that i'm making noises and you and everyone listening is understanding them you know, how amazing is that? How amazing that I get to be a person that's conscious. You know, everything is just super mind-bogglingly beautiful, but we forget because it's every day. You know, Richard Dawkins, another one of the horsemen uh, with, with Harris, uh, he said that the garden is beautiful even though it doesn't have actual fairies in it, that it's just as magical without it. And so if you if you take away the supernatural concepts of the term magic, to me, life becomes magical. And my job as a performance magician, as a fake real magician that Harris is talking about, is to metaphorically exaggerate these beautiful truths that are underneath our nose every day. You know, I remind people that there is healing. I remind people that something can be destroyed and brought back together. Something can can just go and that we have lost where you just, you didn't know this element in your life, this thing that was true could just go away. And now, you know, I, you know, I no longer have a father. 
you know, uh, or that in good or bad, magic is these things that surprise us. And the more that we are sensitive to it, we can celebrate the beautiful ones. We can celebrate the, uh, I call them the triumphs and tragedies are the things that pull the rug out from underneath us. And they're horrible because you have to rethink who you are. You know, if you win the lottery, it's just as bad as losing a loved one because you're like, well, who am I now in the face of this? You know, but a magician at no cost to you could metaphorically pull the rug out from underneath you and make you question everything just as if you went through an extreme. So I'm in a you know, I totally agree with, with Harris when if you're talking about the term of supernatural magic. But to me, the magical experience is happening constant. You know, the fact that I'm experiencing everything as it is right now is not true. It's so amazing, you know, that, that when I see the color green, it's not necessarily the truth of what that greenness is. It's just my brain's magical interpretation of that green. So I love celebrating perception and concepts that we as human beings have created and we only do that through art and being creative. Yeah. That's, that's so interesting. And one thing it has me thinking about is because of all of your philosophy of magic, does that, how does that affect your, uh, your process for starting to develop a new effect? Because I think, I think in a way, in order to come up with a new idea, you want less barriers of things to be in your way. And you have so many different concepts that you're always thinking about. Where do you typically start when you're coming up with something new? Well, it's counterintuitive. You would think of them as barriers. But the only problem with barriers are when they're imposed uh, and when they're false. Okay, so if you don't have any barriers, let's say we have a blank canvas. Well, every dot is right and wrong to an unknown ending. So the first thing an artist needs to know is that there are no rules. There are There is the existence of a blank canvas and everything you do is right and wrong. So then you have that, what do I do then? If everything is right and wrong, well, you can either start doing stuff and being creative and then make up the rules as you go along. Or if you have the foresight, you can go deeper and deeper and deeper and create fundamental truths within your art that guide you to a, a, to a path that you will not have to double back on. You know, what a lot of artists do during their young learning process is they try something and then they go, yeah, it, it, I don't like what that's representing. And then they have to come back a little bit and then try another path. That's great. If, if, and that works. But uh, when you've been creative for a while, you realize that self-imposed rules, self-imposed limitations, self-imposed uh, boundaries are actually what shortcut and allow you to look like you're a genius, you know, when in truth we're all the same and it's just art, uh, that, that it looks like I got further ahead because I had these foundational uh, guidelines. Mm -hmm. And if your guidelines are wrong though, if you just start imposing like my guidelines onto your art, um, they might not be the right guidelines for you. It might be the right ones for me, but they might be wrong for you because now we have to go back to the original rule, there are no rules. So you need to create your own rules in guiding you on your own creative path. That's why in like an art form like martial arts, there is guidelines imposed by a teacher because if you don't do what he says, you're going to get thrown across the room. But in an expressive art form, such as performance magic, such as painting and drawing and poetry and anything that's about you, your identity, you know, martial arts even gets to being about your identity eventually. But at first, you need to learn the fundamentals. But in expressive art, immediately it's about, well, who's doing this? Who is the artist? That's just as important as the quality of the art is where is the source. So you need to create your own rules or else you're going to be doing a lot more work. Uh, so those boundaries that limit 
some artists, if they're imposed or if they're, um, you know, if they have to be there because, you know, when I was a kid, I couldn't afford the best magic tricks. So I had limitations when I was young that were imposed on me. But instead of letting that scare me, I embraced them and made them my own. Uh, that's one way to get around imposed limitations. Uh, but then eventually uh, you'll get into a, a position where you're comfortable with your environment and you'll have to make your own limitations to be creative. Yeah, no, no, I love that too. And you know, when I, when I think of your magic, one thing that I, I love about your magic too is, uh, you know, you're very skilled with like card magic and that's something that's such a go-to for so many magicians, but I would argue the things that you're most known for are not your card magic at all. I, when I think of Garrett Thomas, I think of the Rubik's cube. I think of your work with, with rings and I think of your, uh, your, uh, big coin little purse which was one of my favorite, most inspiring things uh, th that you've done. And one thing I love about that that routine so much is just that like, it's so out of the box with coins and coin magic, at least from all of the coin magic I've been exposed to, and beyond just the idea of, of growing and shrinking, just those tools used together, and, and especially a lot of those techniques that you use, which are kind of very unique to your performing style in the way you perform. And, and thinking about that, connecting it to what we were just talking about, like at what point in, in, in some of those moves there, I mean, to put it honestly, without giving things away, you have some very bold moves that would be very intimidating to even do in front of an audience, especially close up. At what point do you realize like, is this good? And can I, for lack of a better phrase, get away with it? There's a lot of stuff there. Yeah, um, there so the, uh, Working backwards, um, you know, I, I, it was it was bold ignorance to uh, to not when I was young, you know, 12, 13. I mean, I started playing with the Bitcoin Little Purse concept when I was like 10 years old and uh, it was horrible. And then I'm practicing with a mirror, which is really a limited point of view if I only can watch myself. I never considered the bad angles and that there that I have to perform with people surrounded. So I first invested a lot of time in something that was tight uh, on viewership. Then I had put so much time in it. Once I got into the real world, I realized, oh man, it's so hard. <laughs> but I was so good at it that I needed to make little adjustments. So, you know, I'm, I'm actually fortunate enough to have been ignorant of those limitations because I wouldn't have invested so much time. And then when I got wise enough, I would have looked at this is a bad, this is a, a very bad method for an environment where I might be surrounded. But because I did put so much time in it, I can now be surrounded yeah. and still get away with this. Um, it all stemmed from one thought, though, uh, to kind of answer a, a, an earlier uh, implication. It all stemmed from the idea of if I was if I was ha was able to vanish a big coin. So if I had a jumbo coin, a lot larger than this. So if I had a, a, a big, big coin and I was able to just vanish it, well, how valuable is me vanishing a coin this size? You know, um, there it is. Uh, but how, if I can vanish a jumbo coin, what is the beauty? What is there to be celebrated in vanishing a smaller coin? And I didn't want to ruin through, you know, uh, hindsight, the value of, of uh, vanishing a, a half dollar or a silver dollar. So I needed another source of origin for the jumbo coins. I didn't want them to just come out of my hands out of nowhere because literally people could say, uh, the uh, Jerry Maguire quote, show me the money. Why did you waste my time vanishing these little coins when the whole time you could have vanished these big coins? 
Mm. So it was an artistic decision for me to go, well, where should these big coins come from? And it led my mind to, well, coins would come from a coin purse. So big coin little purse was just me removing the source of origin from self. And it's not from me. It's, it's literally from uh, the, 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 uh, the change purse. So uh, for, for me to evan- vanish the, uh, a, a smaller coin, uh, that, would be, uh, that would be okay. But as soon as that coin gets bigger and bigger, and actually we could, uh, let me uh, tilt this down a little bit. Um, we, could, we could play with this. Yeah. Uh, so uh, we, we could, there we go. There's another one here. So we got some of this uh, money hanging out here. The traditional uh, behind the ear uh, coin, that's that's good as well. But um, we have the uh, four Kennedy half dollars, all uh, good. If you were here, I, I, I would let you check them out. Um, you know, I don't know. Could, Can I check could, could, could you, uh, yeah, uh, just just examine examine one of these. Okay. Um, if you, if you could, I don't know if you can if you're able to. Yeah. Yeah. How yeah. does that look? That's real. That's definitely real. Here. Yep. Here. Cool. Thank you. Um. Good. So, uh, now, uh, we could put these right back where they came from. Uh, I don't know if you can shrink that down and wow. put that be behind the ear here, or um, <laughs> uh, maybe this one goes up over here. Good. And uh, let's go with this one over here. Great. And uh, this last one, of course, um, we can hang it in midair. It's weird when they just hang in midair. That's that's. Uh, there's one. There's two. There's three, and then the, the fourth one. It looks like it's in my hands, but it really is actually on the table the whole time, right in front of you. All oh. four coins. That's one, two, three, four. Uh, so I'm not sure uh, what that's about, but that's this amazing. is the original part of the routine. Now I no longer perform this before Bitcoin Little Purse. Mm. This is no longer. This is what I used to do. This is what you remember because yeah, it's been yeah. a while since you've seen me perform. Uh, because you know I tried really hard to make all of this about shrinking. That that is a very small coin and it grows. Well, artistically, nothing in my body language, I could not get enough mime into it to really communicate shrinking. You know, uh, on my video, I added another phase with a smaller coin to really make sure I'm communicating it. But the original routine didn't have that smaller coin. Uh, the original routine was about uh, the, the the big coin or the uh, these coins being hung and then all of a sudden, uh, it would be uh, it would be grow. So now, if I'm doing this routine, it's it's most often that I just uh, I start with the coin like this, and it's a whole separate routine in and of itself. Um, so the uh, you can bend the coin, we can shrink it down a little bit. I don't know if you can see this. There we go. And now that's very small. I mean, that's super tiny. Yeah, that's really small. Humidity. Right, but it's you know we can grow, make it grow right there, you know, and you could really see that. Uh, but the coin doesn't actually change size. I mean, it kind of looks like it in your mind, but oh wait, that is uh, that is a uh, that's a, that that is kind of big. That's really big. I, actually, I don't know if, if can you uh, check this out too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. Is it is that is that? I mean, that's solid, right? Wow, look at the size of that. Just so people could see the size of my hand. Holy cow, that is humongous. Definitely very solid. There you go. So good. And, uh, and, and of course we could shrink that back down and that still fits uh, inside the purse. Uh, but there's no way to really fit that, that size coin uh, inside the purse. You would think, I mean, it is the same size as this one. Uh, so I don't know if that's, uh, if, if that's normal for you, but, uh, but these aren't even the ones that I worry about. Uh, actually, uh, this is the one that really concerns me. Oh, and that's even bigger. Uh, I don't know if you can. I mean, you got bigger hands than I. I don't know if you. Oh, if yeah. you can, yeah, yeah, is that look? I mean, look at that one. Wow, I mean, that's huge. Where in my hand? Oh my gosh! Look at that. That is remarkable. Holy cow! 
I will need that back though. Oh, just, Gary. You can't keep that. Thank you. I'm <laughs> just, just saying. I mean, uh, these are expensive. So thank you. Uh, but uh, yeah, so, you know, that is, it all stemmed from me saying, you know, if, if I could just vanish this coin, yeah, you know, which I, I can, uh, but I never do because what's the beauty in, in, in this? If, 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 you know, basically everyone artistically would have the right to go, why did you waste my time with these, the little coins when the whole time you could have, you know, just show me the money, show me what you can yeah. do. Yeah. Don't, don't, uh, don't, you know, we, we have this responsibility as an artist to give something of value. You know, you want to know who you are and know who, why you're different and yeah. say, you know, here's something for you. Well, you wouldn't give somebody something they obviously already have. And you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't like give them uh, $10 you know, and and then take the ten dollars away, and then give them twenty. Then take twenty dollars away and give them a hundred. Just yeah. just give them the hundred. If you're going to give them the hundred, give them a hundred. So basically, I would be doing something and then canceling it out artistically and showing, hey, I got these bigger coins, and then canceling that out artistically if it all came from the same source. Mm -hmm. So my creative thoughts were based on the foundational idea that, well, what's the value? If I can just vanish this, you know, if I would just be able to to make this disappear, yeah, uh, it, it, also, it also makes a better story within this routine as well. I think, which yeah, the story evolves. Now, um, I want for the magicians that are listening, I want to caution them that notice I'm not telling a story. Mm. I am being the story. People are now going to talk about this guy was popping coins out of this purse on 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 the podcast I was watching. You know, I. Uh, they, it's not that, uh, you know, once upon a time I met a guy and he had these, it was a very small guy and he had these big, it looked like big coins, but they were normal size coins. He was just a very small guy. Yeah. You know, I, I don't want to pull people into a story. That's the job of movies. That's the job of literature. That's the job of poets. Mm -hmm. My job is to twist reality. Yeah. So I need to keep you in reality. Uh, so I need to be a person actually uh, you know, that, that's what's kind of uh, what I don't like about uh, these uh, Zoom magic shows mm -hmm. is that it's really hard for me to to get you to accept my authenticity. Yeah. You know, and one thing I know we were talking about this the other day when we were talking, and uh, that reminds me of an example of, uh, you know, when I was first starting out in magic, uh, I started off with the Michael Lamar original series that he did. And one thing he always said is he, he, one thing he tried to do, which I think that you do very well is making your magic performance. It's just you. It's like hanging out with Garrett rather than what he said. He'd always see these magicians that, that turn on and turn into magician mode and then start doing a, you know, almost like acting like an actor. Uh, yeah. That, that all stems from the misunderstanding of an old quote uh, by a French magician uh, Robert Houdin, who said that we are not magicians, that we are actors portraying the roles of magicians. And uh, I think he understood that quote quite differently than the way modern magicians wrap their heads around it. Yeah, They, they think that it's about not being supernatural. Mm -hmm. And um, I think that he was talking about not believing your own hype and not that we, you have to remember that this is, kind of an act but you are a magician if you provide these experiences yeah it matters not that we now know that hypnosis is not a supernatural power mm -hmm. right a hypnotist never is got power to influence you because of a supernatural thing mm -hmm. they set up the conditions that if and only if you follow their lead, you can enter an alternate state of mind that we consider as hypnosis. But they're not really a hypnotist. They're a guide. You know, but we still have the word hypnotist. In the same way, a magician, a modern magician, a performance magician, is someone who sets up the conditions for you to experience magic. 
for you to enter in the perception of an alternate truth. You know, movie magic is the fact that these storytellers get you to forget about your reality and pull you into a story. You know, I much would I would much rather watch someone like Freddy Krueger than uh, Law and Order or let's say um, uh, SVU. SVU, man, I'm watching it and they pull it in and then based on a real story. Mm. And now I'm calling my sisters, make sure, man, make sure you got someone with you. Where are you? Are you safe? Yep. You know, because now it took that story and educated me about the truth of the world we live in. But it, it's so statistically, you know, uh, low, but yet it happens with every woman. Uh, yep. They have to think about these things. So we need to be empathetic about it. But um, it's uh, it, it's a it's a platform for education more than uh, entertainment. I don't think uh, SVU should be used as entertainment. I think it's education about mm. struggles that we are facing uh, as, a, as a humanity. Um, magic is, I'm supposed to be twisting reality, but a horror movie like uh, uh, Freddy Krueger, as I can get sucked in, believe while watching this movie, suspend my disbelief, while watching this movie that this guy can haunt our dreams. And then as soon as it's over, the adult comes back and goes, wait, oh yeah. I mean, it's just a movie. There are no supernatural beings that can haunt and affect me in my dreams. And, and, and um, something like that's so effective is that, yeah, it's not reality, but it's still based in something kind of similar to a reality in, in that it takes place in the real world, right? Yeah. The, the, what Freddy Krueger represents symbolically is more important. You know, if you study horror movies, there are uh, symbolisms in it that echo the human condition, stuff that Joseph Campbell has pointed out and stuff like that, that all stories have this. Now, horror genre uh, has certain symbolisms in it because it's kind of uh, a certain type of, of uh, journey. It's a certain type of hero's journey that yeah. they're going on. Uh, if you watch, um, uh, what was the movie? The Legend of uh, Leslie Vernon. It's a horror movie that if you like horror movies, like if you're not into horror movies, ignore this uh, suggestion. But if you like horror movies but never really studied the symbolism in it, uh, the Leslie Vernon uh movie i don't even that's not the title but it's like the the legend of leslie vernon it's a meta horror movie where it's a journalist talking to a villain about why he does certain things in every horror movie and why they go after certain characters and and so if you want to learn all of the psychological uh symbolisms in that genre that's a great uh movie that uh, in a meta way uh, exposes itself. Uh, magic has those symbolisms. Uh, you know, even art in painting, there's there's a female side and a, and a male side of a canvas. There are uh, reasons for certain colors and certain uh, symbols that we find in art, and that that an artist knows because they're deep in their genre. Uh, you know, every art form has these these deeper metaphors, and when they don't it seems to be missing something. You know, even uh, the Beatles, I want to hold your hand, has a hand clap in it, which is beautiful. And the hand claps stop every time the Beatles are talking about anything tactile. And when I touch you, I feel happy inside. It's such a feeling my love can't hide. Why would these well-trained poets use feel and feeling as rhymes unless they had, did it for a reason. Because feel and feeling is not a good, you know, artistically, it would be bad. Nope, they were right because they were touching, literally, on the tactile elements of a hand. So the Beatles, when saying, I want to hold your hand, were not singing this about a specific girl or a specific love interest. They were actually literally talking to the audience. So they no longer could clap because they were either holding the hand of the listener or reaching out to the listener. Yeah. Now, I don't know if this was uh, a 
an accidental metaphor uh, or, or if this was uh, chosen by one of the Beatles or uh, I think it was Abbey Road that that was uh, recording this, if this was a George Martin type of thing. Uh, I never got any confirmation on this uh, concept, but it is there that the hand claps go away when they're talking about anything tactile. So when they say, I want to hold your hand, the hand claps stop because symbolically they're reaching out and they're holding your hands. Uh, now, regardless of whether that is artistically done on purpose, it's there. And this song had 52 weeks on the charts, four yeah. seasons, 52 weeks is a year, like four seasons of being number one. Yeah. Like it's mind boggling to think, uh, how did this connect with this audience? Yeah. It was the right people saying the right words at the right time. And that taps into something symbolic. Yeah. And uh, the Beatles were the, the first band that were talking directly to the audience. So this is all creative choices. But if you get to the deeper levels of your own art form, those choices become a lot more obvious and you shortcut to, well, what do we put in as a, a, as a drum beat? Maybe yeah. a hand and I want to hold your hand, you know? Yeah, no, and I love that. Again, you have that, all that thinking that goes into your performing, which is one thing I love so much about what you do. And even other magicians, like I know I'm a fan of Michael Kent as well. He, he, he's really another person that really thinks about his process in a way that other, that many magicians I have seen are like, Oh, people might like this. It's flashy type of a thing. It's really a deeper level that you're going into. And one thing that makes me think about with the magic that you make is that I know that you also, you teach this magic to other people and you have things available such as this series, inside the mind of Garrett Thomas where people can learn some of these effects now because of how you perform like how do, how does that affect how you're because your, your your effects are so personal to you you almost can't imagine anyone else doing it yeah and and that happened organically all those three videos uh, I noticed a lot of people don't do the routines a lot of people study the routines a lot of people can do the routines yeah. but there becomes a certain path in their own growth where they want to do their own stuff as well so because it, it won't fit it's like wearing somebody else's suit you know it just it just doesn't fit so they study it and then organically will grow out of it and you and, know what? Uh, so now my newer products i try to teach more methods than I use so that you could choose what fits you best and also constant suggestions about this topic, how to pull the art out of you, you know, how to put yourself into it so that you don't end up trying to do exactly what I did. You know, my path is my path. Yeah, and it reminds me, I have another quick clip uh, from Sam Harris when he was talking about art and artists, and I, I, I believe it was in the frame of magic, but it reminds me a lot of what you're saying. So let me play a quick clip here. The, the difference between real and fake art, and we were talking about this, par this paradox that you know, the art seems to be incredibly valuable, uh, and yet the value isn't located in the object itself or can't be obviously located there because a forgery that is the materially the exact copy of some masterpiece is essentially worthless and the real masterpiece even if it uh, un suffered some damage would be incredibly valuable and so where is the value to be located and so the, the, i know it's a little different from what we we're talking about but it does kind of remind it's, it's all it's all connected yeah. you know magic deals with the manipulation of perception perception deals with concepts Concepts are the actual spiritual world, word, or world, excuse me. <clears throat> They're the actual spiritual world. If you go back in time, you had the material world and this world of concepts, the spiritual world. Now, outside my house is a road. Well, it's a road symbolically, spiritually. It's only a road because you and I and my neighbors say so. It's asphalt. It is materially yeah. hard rock and asphalt. It's not a road until we say so. So the concept of making it a road is a magical one. You know, so Samuel Harris is, is uh, and this is young Harris. I think he would talk differently about this now. 
uh, because he's now looked at these terminologies, although he's absolutely right in the, the popular way that people use the word magic. Uh, I'm using the word magic to represent purely the perception of things, that the way I see red is a magical experience. My job as a magician is to manipulate those experiences, mm -hmm. not to manipulate the truth of the material, but to manipulate how you perceive that. So my, this is not a home. This is wood and brick that I hide in often. It becomes a home because I feel like it's a home. And it's so it's spiritually, it's magically a home because we're dealing in a world of concepts. So when they, you know, when books of wisdom talk about uh, that we're in a spiritual battle, it's because humans have created a world of concepts that I'm a Garrett and I'm a magician in a home talking, you know, through the technology that we have in front of us to people that have their own home and identities. Uh, these are beautiful, magical things that we are dealing with, but they're called life. And I think my job as a magician is to remind you, hey, this is a beautiful thing. It's not perfect. We're going to keep it growing. We're going to make it better. But we have this art piece started. You know, we, we started painting. Maybe we started a little uh, ignorantly. Maybe we started this art piece called society, called humanity. Maybe we started it with some ignorance, but we have the the control of the paintbrush. We can choose to gloss over some things and repaint it, or we can and probably keep a lot of beautiful things that we've already created. You know, we're we're this we're create we're collectively artists creating this world. Uh, so I think the job of a magician who is going to symbolically remind you that you're all magicians, the same job is there for artists that are symbolically reminding you that we're all artists mm -hmm. and entertainers to symbolically remind us that it's to focus on the beautiful thing that merrily, 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 merrily focus on the positives mm -hmm. because it's all an art piece. Life is but a dream. Yeah. You know, it's, it's what you want to make of it. So we need art, you know, right now it's, it's tricky because we're all, uh, kind of socially distant and we're feeling identity pressure on each one of us because yeah. of the lack of experiencing and giving art. That exchange helps us create this art piece called humanity. If you don't have art, I don't know how it could get shaped. You know, yeah. if you don't have identity and expression, which all comes from art, I don't know where this would go it would just be chaos. Yeah. Huh. Yeah, no, I, I definitely I definitely see that. You know, another thing that has me thinking about too is like, because one thing I know that you do is you do some like consulting with other types of businesses and stuff. And yeah. especially since this is a maker podcast, which people may be surprised by if they've gotten this far into the conversation. <laughs> um, but one thing I really wanted to talk about too is how, how what type of um, value can other trades get out of having this type of magician's mindset when trying to be creative? Um, well, you know, it, it, it all stems from balance and this, the old concept, uh, which many people have heard about uh, the story about the uh, rocks, you know, yeah. uh, put in, you know, the big rocks first. Uh, th there's a story of a teacher who, who brings out a bucket and uh, he puts in these big, you know, softball size rocks. And he says to the class, can I put any more in? And the class says no. And then he pours in a bunch of uh, smaller rocks and they fall in between the rocks. Can I put any more in? And uh, they say no. And then he pours in sand and, you know, uh, which some kids kind of caught on to and then, and then flattens it out, scrapes it down and says, can I put any more in? And the kids say no, and he then grabs water and pours that in, and it fills it up, and then he levels it off. And he says, what's the point? And kids say, "You, no matter how busy your life is, there's always room for more. And uh, that's not the point. Uh, the point is it would be impossible to put the big rocks in last. Yeah. That Think about the deep things first. Yeah. You know, I met this guy, so we're, 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 we're talking about, creativity. I met this guy at this bar and I've talked about 
this before. And he walks in and goes, the garbage man is here. And we're like, oh, goodness, who is this guy? You know, what the garbage man? Come on. And uh, he's drinking with his friends, having a good time. And then his friends go outside for some reason. And he's there, you know, and he comes up to me and goes, hey, 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 hey. I go, what? what? What's up? And he goes, dude, I'm the garbage man. And I said, yeah, we, we heard you when you came in. And uh, he said, no, you don't get it. it. It's it's not gone, you know, until I take it away. You know, people trust me with everything. They, they're all of their, all the things they want to let go of in their life are not gone. They're just outside. They're just outside their home. Yeah. You know, at the curb. And, and, you know, I can find out anything about anybody, but I'm the last step. I'm the last step to getting rid of all the things they want to let go of. And I'm like, dude, you're the garbage man. And, and then, you know, uh, he found a way to make what he does, what he did art. Mm. He found a way to shift his paradigm to think about how he's connected to all of us. And that we're all you're like right, right now we're realizing that the waiters and and electric workers and people that keep our phone systems and industries like hospitals and and people we don't pay nearly enough um, are are so much more important yeah than we ever could have imagined because we we didn't have you know we were so busy looking at these celebrities you know dancing with their laser lights and smoke machines that we forgot that the person feeding you is doing more of a service to you than the person distracting you. Mm -hmm. And uh, this time, uh, you know, I hope that 2020 opens our eyes, you know, being that, that it's all about vision. It opens our eyes that we're all connected, that everybody at every level, you know, I, 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 I wish we lived in a world where people were at that level where you were a garbage man because you wanted to be, yeah. not because uh, you, you, that's the only job, your, your culture, your life, your, uh, your, your society allows you to do uh, because you were forced into it. Um, there are people that will take those roles uh, because they're called to it for their own reasons. We just got to give them space to figure that out yeah it's very it's very tricky so i i think this way of thinking will help anybody any industry to figure out well how what am i really providing people don't think about the money yeah focus on the art the money will come yeah right the focus of money is the destruction of any art form. I think they put it another way uh, that the love of money is the root of all evil. Yeah. And if your focus is the money, you're going to cut corners on your art, right? If, if, if the focus was on the money, my tailor would use cheaper, cheaper cloth, less thread counts. You know, they would just stitch it together lightly. Yeah. They only want it to last a year so they could sell me more. Yeah. But if you if you meet a real seamstress, and I, I mean I, I've seen your work, so you know oh, the I difference know. between something that's shoddy and made, you know, because with no care. Yeah. And I mean, I bet how how often do you get a suit and then tear it apart and restitch it or or do something to it because it's just not made right. Well, yeah, well, again, any kind of suit you get is, is mass produced. It's not tailored to you. And that's a big part of the difference, too. And a lot of what you're saying uh, it reminds me of something that So I, I do another podcast with uh, my friend, our friend, Brian Miller, who's who's watching now as well. And he likes uh, some of your, your things we're talking about here. But that's something we were talking about recently, too, about about having that passion behind what you're doing, making it your art. And, and then and you come to that by really asking yourself about your why. You know, you're, why, why are you doing it? I, when I was a kid, I wanted to be a magician. I didn't want to grow up and pretend to be a magician. So why would I become an actor portraying the role of a magician? No one says, I want to grow up and pretend to be a doctor, right? We just, if you're called to be a doctor, you want to do that. So whatever you want, own it. Just like my friend, the garbage man, yeah. you know, that's who you are. And you could be more than just one job title. 
Yeah. You don't have to be the garbage man. You could be a garbage man, singer, comedian. You know, you can own other identities, but I don't think we are really celebrating a magician, uh, you know, a, 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 you know, a seamstress or a, an artist or a poet. I think we're celebrating people yeah. and the fact that they're passionate about that thing. If an athlete just is good and doesn't have that in the zone passion and fire that you see in the eyes of some athletes, yeah, I don't think the sport would be entertaining. I, I, I think when you see someone on fire, when you see, you know, they're putting a ball in a hoop, but man, when they love what they're doing, when they're in the zone, it's art. Yeah. Uh, it's just beautiful to watch. And it, it just, it just, we as observers go, Oh, I want to be that passionate about what I love. Mm -hmm. It's not about this. The art has to be good. You have to be good at music. You have to be good at your writing. You have to be good at your magic. You got to be good at your, whatever you're choosing as your medium. You have to be, you have to be excellent at it. It has to stand out. But after that, it's really about passion. Yeah. And yeah, what makes it great is how much of yourself you put into it probably. Is, and that's the echo, the passion of what you love. They want to see you love it. Yeah. They want to see, you know, if I'm just sitting there going, you know, it means nothing. You know, the fact that I would be here in the moment and, you know, you know, all of that is artistically me sharing of my own soul. Mm -hmm. You know, when, when you, when you forsake the soul, you, you gain, you, you might gain money, but there's yeah. nothing there. You know, if, um, so one of the guys I consult with is David Blaine. So let's imagine David Blaine wore a blue shirt, mm -hmm. right? And he got a uh, hundred thousand views and likes on his Instagram. And everyone goes, Oh my goodness, the blue shirt, his eyes, man, they look so good. Yeah. Does David Blaine start wearing blue shirts? Right. If he does, who's the artist? He now becomes the art piece. Yeah. And he, the artist is humanity or his fans that based on popular vote could shape him. And that's called pop art. Yeah. You know, uh, and there's a wonderful industry for that. Mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully these pop artists have other uh, passions than their job because their soul is being manipulated by popular vote. So yeah. if you, and this is why you might see uh, people like Britney Spears just lose it. It's not because I, uh, that it's because she w wanted to be a singer and now she's controlled by popular vote and she loses her identity, you know, and it's heartbreaking. Uh, I, I feel for artists that lose their soul. And that is because do not be shaped by views do not be shaped by what works you can do that on the business end of things but don't do that with your art that the focus on money is the root of all evil well money now is attention yes right so we are trading value of about trading attention so don't focus on the likes don't focus on that do what you love the likes will come if you're passionate enough about what you love mm -hmm. all of that will work itself out you kind of it's a balancing act. You kind of have to have a little attention on that, but that can't be your driving force. You do have to make money. You do have to have a business. You have to have all those other elements. You show business. You can't have a show without the business. You know, but, and also just people understanding how it actually works can affect that too, because what you're talking about are vanity metrics. And not yeah. only that, these platforms are de designed to make it look bigger than it is. For, for example, for Facebook and Instagram, for when you post a video and it says it has a hundred views and something for something that count as a view, they only have to watch three seconds of it. Okay. Wow. So, and if you posted a 10 minute long video or an hour long video, I mean, that doesn't necessarily mean that that many people watch it, but they give you those views to encourage you to do more, to get more views. So it, it is a, so not, again, not to say there's no value in, in having views at all, but yeah, it's a balance. you can get caught up in it. Exactly. It's a balance. But one yeah, way it should not be your focus. It's there. Yes. You know, money is a part of our world. It's a magical tool that represents value that we've all agreed upon. It's not a real thing. It's paper. 
Yeah. But it's it 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 is it's alchemy. It we have turned lead into gold. We've turned paper into value. We've turned credit into value. And now we're turning attention into value. Yes. That instead of trading actual money, we're literally what celebrities learned you know years ago is that I don't need to actually have a million dollars in the bank if I have a big enough fan base. Yeah. I can walk into any studio and say, I can get this many people's attention. I have a big enough platform. I have a big enough voice. That is its own value. So yeah. celebrities year, years ago were not trading money. They were trading attention. And now we're all becoming, just like I said, it starts out as magic, then it becomes art, then it becomes identity. Celebrity is becoming identity. That yeah. a major part of who we are in 50 years, or maybe faster, will be our construction of our celebrity. That we all will be ce celebrities at some level and have a fan base at some level. That right now, if you aren't creating something on an, a virtual platform, it's the we are the content creators. But in 50 years, you won't even exist if you don't do that. Oh, you'll, yeah. be, you'll still be there like Amish people are still in our world, but we we won't even like notice uh, because the virtual world will just keep on moving, you know, and it's the new art piece we're creating. This yeah. is a new layer of identity. Yeah, yeah. No, absolutely. You know, one, one thing I want to connect uh, connect to is one thing that we were talking about uh, a little bit earlier that got us into this um, was talking about the value of using this type of creative process to uh, for 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 other industries. And another example that I'd compare it to, like in a way, sci-fi is magic in a way, and the way it, it has also inspired current technologies that we have. You know, a lot a lot of people identify that. Uh, that like uh, Steve Jobs creating the iPad was kind of inspired by Star Trek, which was way before any of that. And here's a, a reference photo is that they had, they used things that were considered fantasy at the time, but it inspired people to create something. I have one more quick example. That's a video too of, and this was it's in the video. It says new, but this was from 2015 but a, a new form of 3D printing. Every 3D printing was always done layer by layer, like a regular printer, just going yep. up. And then uh, this was something that they came up with inspired by the Terminator. So a bunch of scientists from a company called Carbon 3D just introduced a totally new kind of 3D printing. They were actually inspired to make it from the movie Terminator 2. So in the same way, these, these fantasy and sci-fi things can inspire other industries in a way that you wouldn't have expected. I think the same can be said for the magic process and is why I would encourage people who maybe even don't want to become a magician uh, to follow your work and your YouTube channel uh, where you get inside of a, from a magician perspective. Yeah, that type of magic that you're talking about is the type of magic that is fiction. Yeah. Okay. Uh, fiction has always guided us good and bad. You know, yes, Star Trek created cell phones, iPads, and uh, uh, compact discs. And, uh, you know, they were visionaries. Mm. But at the same time, you know, you, would, you could look at a visionary like a prophet, right? Yeah. But did Star Trek prophesize what was going to happen? Or did they plant the seeds of what they was going to happen? Influenced it, yeah. So we got to be careful mm. because uh, writers like Orwell, mm. the kids that read that are now in our politics today. And maybe they're going, yeah, we can put cameras everywhere. Yeah, we can hack into everyone's phones and monitor everybody. Maybe we were manifesting it artistically, which is why I call out to magicians to be truth seekers and, and about authenticity and not about deception and uh, lies and cons and those are that's black magic that's misusing the tools you know one of the worst magic spells that uh, uh, friends of mine like uh, Jared Koff and Paul Vigil, uh they pointed out that one of the worst magic spells that ever was spoken into existence are the words drink coke and everybody started putting bad chemicals in their body and we've still been doing it you know, that 
spell, that magic words that was said loud enough that everybody was hypnotized by it. And now we are doing things that are bad for us. Uh, to be conscious of what you suggest. So, uh, yeah, there is uh, there is this manifestation, this literal magic that happens in art. Um, you want to be very careful that you create the world you want, not the world you have or not what is popular. You want to add to what you personally believe, and that calls... Uh, you to know who you are and know what you want and know the world you want. You literally are artistically creating it bit by bit by everything you support, everything you view. I used to say that every dollar is a vote. Mm. If you don't believe in something, don't give a dollar. But yep. now every view is a vote. Mm -hmm. You know, Howard Stern said that the people that loved him would watch like a half an hour a day. The people that hated him would watch like four hours a day. Yep. He made his livelihood off of hate. So he's not even the type of character, the shock jock that he was. If you watch his, his documentaries and read his, 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 uh, his history, he was not even that type of person. He became whatever they needed just to keep his job. Yeah. And he found this loophole in the system. And the system is that, uh, people, you can get their attention through negative things, but you know what? You are manifesting a negative world and that you got to pause and make sure artistically you create what you love. Uh, Cause that's again, that when you, when your focus is the money, when your focus is the view, when your focus is what you get yeah, and not what you're creating, you're misguided and you miss the point of any art form. Yeah. Yeah. So there was a comment there. Yeah. Oh, oh yeah. That was, uh, that was, uh, a Brian Seppi. And what he was saying was, let me bring it back up here as, uh, I clearly need to create more content. Your point about the virtual world, world continuing to move forward is so accurate. Yeah. It's not, I mean, for good or bad, I don't, I don't think there is a good or bad about it. You know, is it right or wrong? For me to have the title of a magician when obviously I'm more than just a magician and everybody is more than their job is is it right or wrong for me to claim that I'm a Garrett Thomas that I'm this these sounds are me I'm wearing clothing is that right or wrong you know that's not my identity that's something I choose to do uh, there's a reason I'm artistically choosing to wear black and take on you know the why do I shave my head why do I, I like there are artistic reasons for all this so it's not you know you can sit back and go yeah that's it's bad every everybody is just they're 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 forgetting who they are because they're just looking at these cell phones it's not bad it's different yeah and it's 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 going that way you know, because of the rhythm of life, you know, if you don't like it, don't, you don't have to do it, but it's not going to stop the wave. Yeah. You know, you, they, Amish people have every right to be. Yeah. I'm sorry. They said the same thing about TV when it first came out. They said the same yeah. thing about even corded phones when they first came out. No one's going to leave the house. No one going to be talking. To I mean, it goes on forever. And then we just, as a culture, adapt to these things. But as a word of caution in everyone's life, we gather things, create this identity, and then at some point we dig down to find the real self, yeah. which was there all along. But there are so many layers of my job defines me, my degree defines me, my virtual avatar defines me, my celebrity defines me. And every generation puts another layer of paint on and it makes it harder and harder to get to the core of your own identity. So add layers because we will do that, but know that in your life at some time, you're gonna to wanna to dig through that and find who am I in underneath all of these layers. The layers are beautiful, but know that they're layers that understand that this is a game. This is an art piece. This is something we're creating. Play it. Create. It's a beautiful thing. I like the idea of being human. 
Yeah. I like I I would not give this up. But at the same time, I know that I am technically an animal. I'm technically a human. I'm technically a Garrett. I'm technically a magician. But I can go down to this concept of I and down even further to realizing we are literally all connected biologically and, you know, uh, you know, in conceptually, especially uh, that we, we now are in a time, you know, I talk about 2020. I always, you know, I'm hoping people see what 2020 symbolically represents. It's vision. Yeah. You know, 2020 vision. I'm hoping that we see that a virus in China co is connected to us in America, that some of minorities struggles are connected to every one of us, that, if you do not recognize empathically the suffering or the problems of the least of these, it's connected to all of us. And our, through our arts, through our what we create, we are either ignoring these things or bringing those things to light. And that's just whether or not you want to be an entertainer that distracts people from truth or you want to be an artist that and any art form can do this. Any art form can bring this stuff to light. You can use your platform to bring stuff to light, or you can use that platform to create noise. And we kind of need both. There's time and a place for everything, but you want to choose who are you and what are you? Are you someone that is light or are you someone that is the opposite, the yeah. darkness? But it's not a negative, right? You know, everyone says darkness is negative, but we do need a time of peace. We yeah. do need a time to escape and relax and be entertained. Yeah. But at the same time, we do need to be challenged and educated and enlightened. Yeah. And so it takes this balance. And, yeah. and everything, I believe the art of magic is about a person who understands that balance, that understands the beauty of art and the beauty of science, or maybe the logic of art and the beauty of science in in, a, in a, to say it in that way that being somebody who my job is to imagine the world through every observer's point of view and not my own yeah. i know the truth beyond how these moments actually occur but i need to forget me and only experience it from the point of view of my audience so I've always looked at magic as advanced empathy yeah. and that point of view for any artist to really get in the head of your observer in any medium is so valuable. Yeah. And what a magician sees, you know, is always historically and in myth, you're traveling in the dark times of your life and then you encounter a magician and it's because you have no other answer that he empowers you, not because of really anything they do, but really because he opens your eyes to something that might have been with you all along, that the truth is that you were stronger than you thought, that you had these abilities, and it's only through this enchanted experience in fiction that the, that these fairies and magicians and uh, these uh, uh, enchanted creatures bring this to light. You know, the... We talk about the Wizard of Oz. The Wizard of Oz was not the magician. Oh, yeah. Everybody else was enchanted. Yeah. Not the, the wizard was the only one who was a fraud. And that's not my type of magic. So my type of magic is not pretending to be something. Those people are fake psychics, fake faith healers, fake mediums, fake people that try to sell you something by lying to you. That magicians have historically always been against that. There was a small period of time where magicians were seeing that these people were making more money than they were using the same techniques because they sold it as real. And there was a small period of time where, where magicians like Alexander, these corrupt magicians that were doing dark black magic, they were literally using the art form against the public mm -hmm. and taking advantage of people. Yeah. And uh, that is not what magic started out as, you know, and I, that's not what magic as an art form is. That is a con. Of course, there's con artists, but we don't look at it as an art form. 
you know, it's, it's something that's misused. You can use a knife to cook or kill. Paint could be used to make an art piece, or it could be used to camouflage a tank. Intent matters. So whatever art form you want to do, the foundation pieces of your own intent are valuable. And to step back and look at the literal magic of it all. What am, how am I connected to the world through this art? What does this represent to my audience? And how does this symbolically affect them in the choices they have to make? And these are things you should not think about as an artist daily. But once those big rocks are in place, you can focus on the little stuff. And then your decisions about what path to take, right or wrong, is so fast. Yeah, You know, it's no longer a fear of a blank canvas because you've created your own rules. You've mm -hmm. created your own guidelines that can make you go, oh, nope, I'm going to, I know exactly how I would do this. Yeah. It might not be the answer for everybody, but it's your artistic path. Yeah. You know, one thing you just mentioned there is about the value. And one thing I try to touch on in the show all the time is about how to, with whatever people are making, how to to potentially monetize that in some sort of way. And one thing we touched on kind of early, uh, roughly, was whether or not you should do that. So assuming someone decides that they want to try, um, at what point uh, do you think that they should? You know, because it takes a certain amount of confidence, especially from a performing standpoint, to, 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 to break through with trying to earn an income, let alone a living with this type of work. It, it, it's 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 hard in hindsight looking at my path i got lucky you know um it, it, it but you know what they what they say is i don't believe in luck you know that that luck is the combination of uh opportunity and preparation uh so you got to keep trying you know when when we talk about, I talk about magic, I talk about these, you know, I, I'm a philosopher. So this, the concept of knock and the door shall be opened is wrong. That is not true. There are many, many, many people that beg, pray, and hope for a certain thing, and it's not guaranteed that that door will open. I think something was lost in translation. If you don't knock, the door won't open. That is 100% true. Yeah. That if you don't try that door, it will never come ajar. You have to constantly try. So yeah. on, on some level, my answer to that question would be right away. Yeah. Try to sell it right away. Yeah. Because you could paint, you know, uh, sculptures of uh, Ren and Stimpy. Uh, all yellow, staple them onto uh, a bed sheet, hang it, and call it art, and somebody will buy it. You gotta write that down quick. <laughs> yeah, go for it. <laughs> but at the same time, there's a cost. Yeah. Mm -hmm. You want, you, you know, if someone does buy it, does that manipulate you to think about other cartoon characters you could staple the blankets? Yeah. And does that define you? So, you know, it's, it, it, there's a there's a problem in the in the magician point of view that I see in society is that we don't let children discover who they are until they have their job in place. You know, you know who they are, what they're really made of, only comes when you put. You know the the the, the uh, when you get out there and test it, mm. and you got to kind of experiment, and your identity isn't really formed. You know who you know. We don't even consider us like I growing up wouldn't have considered myself a man until I was like 21, 22. Like that psychologically is not the way humanity is organically it's not tr a true represent representation of who we are in biologically. Biologically, we should have those uh, parts of our development grounded a lot earlier. And whether you know it or not, you probably kind of already do. You know, your early childhood development, who you are, is kind of there. You're just not conscious of them yet. 
And then we're surprised about, oh, wait a minute, I don't like my job. You know, I, I'm not, I'm not sure I, I wanted this re exact relationship. Yeah. And now we pull the rug out from underneath our own self. You know, don't commit to a path until you know yourself. So art is the fastest way to get in touch with who you really are. Yeah. Try things, experiment, put it out there and sell it, but be sensitive to whether or not your relationship with what you're creating is authentic. You need that authenticity. So my advice to what the question is, is if you're authentic, sell it right away at any level. I don't care if it's crap. If you are putting your heart and soul and you're passionate about music, there are artists in every field that suck at what they do technically. Yeah. But we celebrate them because they're passionate. There are magicians I know where I would look at them and go, I don't know why it works, but it works. Yeah. You know, and there are artists, I'm sure, in every field. There are there are mus musicians that other classically trained, you know, professional uh, technique magic musicians would look at and go, I don't like, why is this mainstream? Yeah. Like, why are we celebrating it? It has nothing to do with the art. It has to do with passion. Yeah. So, so much of what you're saying resonates with me because uh, for people who don't know, during the day, I am an elementary school art teacher. So, you know, I work with young kids. And one and one of my favorite quotes that I hear people say is, um, you know, you you're not training kids to be an artist. You're teaching them to, to hold on to it because it's because the kids have so much creativity and a free mind. It's a matter of holding on to that not and not losing it rather than than gaining it. And uh, so, so a lot of that resonates. Uh, I thing i applaud i applaud what you do because sadly our society has forgotten that art and play and the the most important the most important uh classes in any childhood development is art and recess hands down if you get rid of art a lot of people say, well, the kid's not going to grow up and most kids aren't going to grow up and paint. And if they want to, they'll do that at home. Not necessarily. If you get rid of art, you're getting rid of the ability to connect the hand to the brain. You're getting rid of surgeons. You're getting rid of people that have micro ability to manipulate, you know, the world on a minute level. Yeah. People that are creating and can see the world on a small scale. It's so important. If you get rid of the class of sculpture, which should be taught in its own class, separate from drawing. Yeah. Sculpture is our mechanics, people that see the world, architects that can visually see the world in a three-dimensional plane of view. That is so important. Recess gets you to creatively explore. I have a friend who never played games. She was born and she had this immediate ability to read. She could read anything. She had a, like a college level reading at age eight, like crazy. She bare, she never learned to drive. She barely, you know, she never got the concepts of games. And because she didn't play games like chess, she lost the ability of seeing causality. To see that, you know, if I say this to this person, they're going to be mean to me. They're not going to like me as much. And they're going to make my life hell. She had a harder time understanding to be good to somebody because we're all connected. That yeah. causality, like if I make this move, then he'll do this, then I'll do that, and I won't be in a good position. Yeah. Gameplay teaches you how to critically think about the world around us. Art, recess, and games these are the most important things yep. that teach us how to be human. And not only that, but another thing that I always try to mention as well is that, you know, I, I'm working with elementary school kids. Chances are 90% of these kids, we're training them for a job that doesn't even exist yet. Oh, yeah. Okay. So what can we, so the, the most valuable thing I can teach them is creativity. Cause that's the one thing that all employers are looking for is creativity. And well, if I can help them get that, I mean, there's no better value I can give them. I wish every class was taught like an art class. 
I think there there is truth to what you're saying, but there is there is a history to magic. There is a math to magic. There is a science to magic. There is an art to magic. There is a craft to magic. There is a you know every subject needs to be there. Yeah, of course. Now, what you're teaching children now, early childhood development that you're in, young age, it needs to be about creativity. But if you were teaching high school art, it'd be a little different because then I would suggest, no, you really need to focus on what art teaches us. Mm -hmm. But young kids, it, 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 you should be creative about, you should be artistic and creative about history and artistic and creative about science and artistic and creative about math. That, that we need to, to celebrate being passionate about all the different ways to learn because what those subjects teach you. Because granted, I never used uh, trigonometry. Yeah. But I did learn use a lot of math in my magic. Yeah. And learning a little bit about math in my in my high school and college taught me how to how to learn about the math I need later. Yeah. Right. So yeah. how much math do you need creating garments? Yeah. Well, that's a, that's kind of, kind of what you're describing reminds me of like a, a steam education, kind of bringing a lot of these different elements together, which also helps connect it in the children's mind because everything in the world's connected that way. And that's why, you know, the more connections you can make uh, cross curricular, uh, the better it'll be for, for everyone. And, and for it, it, it's heartbreaking when you see teachers that get it and their hands are tied because they want to make everybody the same. I mean, the concept of standardizing tests, either who's going to come up with the cure for the coronavirus, either everybody or nobody. You make it, a, if you standardize humanity, if you make it so there's no mentality of being a garbage man and no mentality of being a magician and no mentality of being a, 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 an architect. If you don't have different people, then either everyone will have the answer or no one. Yeah. And that's the world I don't want to live in. You want diversity. You want to let them explore and see and play and discover their own paradigm, yeah. their own point of view. And in that our world is better because as a team, we are great. Mm -hmm. You know, individually, I can't, I can't make my own food from the ground up. Yeah. I need other people. I need the world around us. So, you know, it's not celebrating diversity and not celebrating the fact that we need everybody, the lovers, the dreamers, and me, you know, I, I always talk about yeah. uh, from the, uh, the rainbow connection. We need everybody. All of us together can make this a beautiful, uh, a beautiful world. Yeah. Yeah, no, absolutely. You know, and one thing that just it's some some of the things that you're mentioning kind of brought me up to this clip that I, I have uh, of a young child doing magic. It just came across it on TikTok the other day, and uh, it was so exciting to see. And a lot of the, the the manipulation kind of reminded me of you, too. So I wanted to show you and just get your response and how encouraging it was to see such a young person doing magic as well. That was some pretty pretty good technique for such a long. Oh, yeah. It was remarkable. Yeah, it, you know, and there there is a there is a, a beauty to that, mm -hmm. but there is a, a cautionary tale at the same time that I see in other art forms, including our own, including magic. But you might see in every industry. Mm -hmm. You want to be careful with children that excel too quickly. So like my friend who read too young, mm. she was excelled in one thing, but was hindered in everything else. I, I know many magicians that are so good and then adults celebrate them and now they don't develop. The Japanese culture, which uh, I'm not sure what culture this, this child was from, uh, but the Japanese culture generally doesn't allow uh, people to not go through all their phases. Mm. That... Uh, I know of an industry that a friend of mine works in where the person who's in management has a higher IQ than the people. Oh, 
well, for running the country. Oh, did we lose my sound? Oh, no, we lost. You're kind of breaking up for a second there. Sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, so the the a person in management has more vision and it is just more intelligent and it has, has a better ability than some of the people that are running the company. However, they don't just promote them all the way to the top, right? They see the value in learning about each phase. And, you know, imagine if you were four years old, but immediately could uh, speak and, and do an art form at a professional level. And you jump to getting everyone's attention. What are you going to talk about? Yeah. You haven't had that struggle yet. You haven't had the ability to put identity. So right now, this kid is amazing, and I love it. Uh, and uh, I can't wait to see what he can do in the future, if and only if adults don't applaud him so much that he forgets to create an identity. Yeah. Like, if they keep on celebrating his skill and giving him attention – because of skill, he'll never create a myth. He'll never create a story. He'll never put himself into it. It'll all be about, look what I can do. Look what I can do. And we need that phase in every art form. We need that in magic. We need that in painting. We need it to be at some level about skill. But it, you need at the same time to be developing all these other layers. So what this kid is doing is hopeful about the skill part of magic for the future, that it will constantly grow like everything does. It will get better. It'll get crazier. It'll get deeper. But at the same time, I hope and wish that we had uh, the wisdom, that the, every magician in our industry had the wisdom to make sure that our young generations go through all the phases it takes to get to a point of view where you can be a fully rounded magician, where it's not just about skill. But I do applaud and am impressed and excited about, you know, I, you know, there's, you know, about this, this, uh, these, this generation's path. No, that's great. No, because uh, it's so you're right. It's so easy to just applaud and encourage that only that one direction rather than growing the entire person as an artist. So I, I really love that you're pointing that out because I think a lot of people would kind of quickly dismiss it just out of the uh, clear talent that that child has. But uh, you know, one more thing I just I do want to get into because we do have to start to, to wrap up soon. Um, is uh, so we talked about how you do some co consulting for creative consulting for like for companies for businesses and you work with some colleges talking to students and stuff but one uh one thing that you've consulted with that i really wanted to make sure we touched on before we left uh is that your work with david blaine with him do you mind talking a little bit about that yeah i mean uh, these uh bigger concepts that uh that i'm talking about uh all stem uh and are all helpful to every industry now david blaine is a magician. He has this thirst for knowledge, this magi wisdom, and constantly studying, constantly growing. That's what really a magician's about. The greatest magician of all time, I think, is Da Vinci. You know, guys like Tesla. Those are the people that are the magis, are the wise men, the people that thirst for how. You almost need to study every art to be a magician. You know, you, you get, you know, your path got into all these other th creative endeavors, not because you were a magician performance, but because you were a magician who sought wisdom, sought information about everything. I can only imagine all the other art forms that you've kind of are still there, but kind of on the side of oh, things yeah. you're passionate about. Yeah. Uh, that's the true spirit of being a magician. David Blaine is one of them. And so I wanted to support him. I wanted to help him. Uh, and my job, with David, even though, you know, he could do it on his own. But when you have a platform that big, we team up, you know, it took him, you know, his childhood to create the magic for his first special. Well, what do you do for another special next year? If it takes years to develop the skill set that a magician needs. So in many ways, magicians because our art form is so complex, 
it's only logical that eventually we team up on some level. But we cannot forsake David's identity. We can't forsake David's soul. And there are many opportunities that David has had where he could have wore a blue shirt to tap into the metaphor I used earlier, where he could have done the popular thing. You know, he turned down a job offer that no one has ever turned down. And his answer to it was, if all the magicians are in Vegas, I want to go to Africa. That he refuses to do what's popular because you would lose who you are. You know, yeah. you, you, would, you would just be following the crowd. And, you know, time and time again, I have always respected uh, David's choices about um, his mystery, his uh, character, and his message. Uh, the symbolism of it all, you know, is so on point. Uh, so I, I became part of the team because, you know, I supported him. He was one of the few magicians that I've seen had the bigger image of magic in him. You know, if you think about the magicians we talk about, you know, Penn and Teller, David Copperfield, Chris Angel, Lance Burton, Siegfried and Roy, you just, and then David Blaine is always in there. You just named five people with big teams and hundreds of millions of dollars of contracts and a guy who started with a deck of cards and a camera. Yeah. Why did that last person, why did David Blaine connect and resonate as loud as guys like Copperfield and Penn and Teller and Lance Burton and all these other amazing, amazing magicians with amazing teams and amazing budgets. Why did David Blaine stick out? Because of authenticity and his embracing of the true spirit of magic. He really hit a nerve about the metaphor and the myth of what it really means to be a magician and what it means to be the symbol of a magician. So David Blaine is not a performance magician. He is the symbol of a magician. He is also a performance magician, but his major uh, point is a symbolic one. Yeah, yeah, and you know, and, and uh, one thing I think is so cool about the fact that you work together, and and like I point out many times, your process and the way you present yourself as a magician is similar to how he is just himself as a magician as well. And a lot of people think it's an act, I think, or at least thought it was an act early on. And one thing I have to say is I was very fortunate because of being friends with you. You brought me in on an opportunity when he performed locally at UB for a show, and I got to be one of his his, uh, show handlers so i got to work with him directly and man who you see is 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 who he is you know and especially because too not only during that event you might say we all went out for dinner out afterwards a, a bar bill for wings which was uh one of my favorite memories and a great story i love telling people for another time i think but sure. oh my goodness that was quite an experience so it, i was just as taken by it as well um when I first saw David Blaine, he came onto television. I wasn't working on the first special. Um, I started working with David. Uh, this is who David is. He made sure we started our relationship on January uh, 2nd, 2003. It was one, two, three was the day that I started working with David Blaine. And that's just who David is. He wants things to have meaning and things to have, you know, what about, what's the story? Everything is a story with David. And when I first got the call from David, I thought somebody was playing a joke on me because surely nobody talks like that. Nobody's like, hey, man, this is David Blaine. And I want to, you know, I, I heard about this ring trick and I got to see it live. You know, and I'm like, who is this? Is this Joe? Is this is this Adam? Who, who's, who is this guy? You know, <laughs> and I thought somebody was pranking me because he had he was just on TV. And now this guy's calling me. Yeah, right. And I didn't believe it. And uh, um, what you see is what you get. We called that first special Fearless because David is fearless. Most of us hide who we are. Yeah. There are very few celebrities that I meet 
that when you see them on a talk show, that too is an, or excuse me, most celebrities I meet, when you see them on a talk show, that too is an act. Yeah. You know, who they really are is another person. But guys like David Blaine and Bill Murray and Woody Harrelson, they just don't care. They are fearless. Now Jim Carrey and, uh, you know, these guys have just, like, let it all go. And David, for some reason, who he is as a person, was able to just let go and not care and just be him. And that I super respected and, you know, wanted a piece of, you know, in, in many ways. So uh, it wasn't an, until I got to know him that I realized that that's just who he is. Yeah. And it's, it was a beautiful thing. And that authenticity, again, it sucked me in, you know, because he was being authentic. It was not an act. Because in when I was analyzed it from uh, a, an artistic point of view, I thought it was a creative choice. You know, this is so brilliant to be an anti-character, to be a, hey, yeah, this is awesome. I, you know, this look, this is great. To be stoic, that contrast would make any reaction seem big. Yeah. And I thought that was a brilliant artistic decision to, if you're going to focus on reactions, which he did organically, it wasn't really kind of planned. It was just what he liked. He has got this sense of style where he doesn't always know how to explain it, but he just knows, nope, I got to be doing this. I need, maybe anyone, other people could do that. I got to be doing this. And in the end, he's generally right. You know, he's just got this, this uh, ability of intuition about his path. And he just focused on reactions. He focused on the observing of magic. And uh, in the end, it's what saved us. It's what made our special. Um, it, it gave our special a magic special with a human element. Most magic specials, you have to kind of suspend your belief and pretend as if you were there live. Here, by focusing on reactions, we were really creating a documentary about people enjoying magic. It was not about the magic itself. It was about the human element, which was authentic reactions to David Blaine's magic. And that's what we were celebrating. And I wanted uh, I wanted to be a part of that. Yeah. And uh, I mean, again, you said it perfectly. I think it's a good through line for a lot of what we've talked about, too, is that authenticity and being a diverse artist uh, to, 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 for really whatever creative outlet. And like you said, uh, uh, David Blaine is a very good example of that. And here, here's when I, I was... Uh, <laughs> <laughs> right, right before we walked into the bar, I think. But uh, uh, yeah, but yeah, it was a quite. A good, it was a good night. It was a really good night. But anyway, I, at this point, I think we should start to to wrap up. If, uh, for anyone else who's watching this too, uh, Garrett's uh, information has been scrolling the whole time. Follow him on Instagram at GT Magician. Uh, he's got an amazing YouTube channel that I'm going to bring up right here. Uh, just type in his name into YouTube, Garrett Thomas or Garrett Thomas Magician. His channel will come right up. He's his videos are so. Uh, uh, unbelievable. You'll learn so much about not just magic, but really just philosophy of being creative. So I highly, highly recommend you check out his channel and his videos. And Garrett, thank you so much for coming on the show. Is there anything else you want to say to people before we wrap up? No, I'm just glad to, uh, you know, share what I'm passionate about, you know, and I, being creative, I think is uh, what has gotten us to all the beautiful things in our world and uh, the things, you know, every generation gets better and what we're going to let go of all the ugly things that are a part of our world is only going to happen by the next generation being more creative and creating the world we want to have and not the world that, uh, that is all focused on, uh, you know, the, the, the value of things, money, attention, let's g get, focused back on what you're passionate about and uh, just do what you love and you know the rest will organically happen perfect yeah and for more information to contact uh, garrett check out www.gtmagic.com thanks a lot and we'll see you guys next time